Welcome to One on One with B'nai B'rith International. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thank you for spending some time with us today. I hope you're staying home, wearing your masks, washing your hands, and taking good care of yourselves. Our goal is to bring you conversations that provide meaningful perspectives on a range of topics. And uh, we're really pleased today to have as our guest from Brussels, uh, Ambassador Francesco Tallo, Italy's permanent representative to NATO. He's a diplomat with longtime experience uh, serving around the globe. He first joined Italy's Foreign Service in 1984. He since held several key postings, uh, such as Consul General in New York. He was part of the permanent mission of Italy to the United Nations, and he was director for South America within Italy's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. More recently, Ambassador Tillo served as Italy's ambassador to Israel, and before becoming Italy's permanent representative to NATO, he was coordinator for the 2018 OSCE Conference Against Antisemitism, which was held in Rome. Now, in our conversation today, I'll be asking Ambassador Tillo about his home country's response to the coronavirus pandemic, his time as Italy's ambassador to Israel, and his efforts to combat anti-Semitism in Europe. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to, to, to meet you. Uh, so we are, each of us is in the house as well. Actually now I'm working today. We are alternating um, weeks of, uh, week of um, work uh, from home and a week in my office at NATO. So we, we made the two teams and uh, in order to be safe um, but to ensure continuity and somehow we are, i'm entering already in a topic of discussion because our lives are so much uh, um, conditionated by this great uh, great uh, emergency but, so i want to really, i want to i want to start really if i can just just with that and italy because italy really was at first the hardest hit and really for days, uh, you know, we're sitting here in the United States and of course we, we have clearly our, our own very serious problems, but for days, really a lot of the focus was on Italy. Now that seems to have, have flattened out a bit. Um, I just want to say one thing, um, uh, B'nai B'rith Italy, for example, uh, was uh, very uh, early on, I had put out an appeal uh, to, to us uh, to see if we could be helpful in some way and B'nai B'rith actually did send 27,000 face guards uh, for medical personnel uh, to the government in the Lombardy region, which of course was the hardest hit. How is it now? How is the situation going forward in Italy today? Well, things are going better, but we are still in the tunnel. So we, the situation is not yet, uh, uh, let's say, really uh, good, no, not at all. People are dying. Uh, but there is a clear improvement of the situation. And this is thanks, first of all, solidarity we received. Thank you. Thank you to Maybrit. Um, and the discipline of Italian citizens, the hard work of our um, uh, healthcare people. So I really have to pay homage to our national uh, health system. I think that in these days, uh, really, they are like the firefighters in, on September 11th. I remember all the, the admiration we had for firefighters and policemen in New York City. The same is now all over Italy, especially in Lombardy, for uh, medical doctors, for all uh, the personnel working in hospitals. They've been the, the heroes of this story. And, uh, but I have to say, uh, the resilience of the country has been really very, very strong. So um, this is maybe somehow counterintuitive. It goes against some um, stereotypes about Italy. But people uh, have been uh, really disciplined. Uh, so the measures taken uh, early, maybe never enough early, but early by the government in terms of um, confinement, uh, lockdown, uh, what? Uh, there have been very severe measures, but uh, people accepted them because understood that this was in, uh, in the interest of, uh, of health. 
uh, now since few days, um, starting uh, last Monday, there has been a, a, a passage, a very gradual one, to a so-called phase two. And so something is opening, but still people are wearing masks, uh, lots of uh, business are closed. And um, let's see, if things will continue with this positive trend, there will be further openings. And something important, and here I come to, um, to our work at NATO, is that, for instance, we are no more requesting assistance from allied countries like we did from the beginning. And it's been really great, the assistance we received, that we are really, really grateful for to, to the allied countries. Uh, now we don't request it anymore. Instead, we are starting to offer assistance to others. And uh, it's a two-way solidarity, of course. It cannot never be uh, one way. So we started uh, already Italian doctors and uh, assets are in Kosovo, in uh, Bosnia, so in the Balkans, where we have net operations, uh, where we have people uh, working there for our common security. And um, we offered assets to the, the Supreme Command uh, of, uh, of NATO here in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium. But uh, really, the solidarity we received from the United States, from, uh, from the Brit, from private and from the administration have been uh, um, really very important. But especially given the circumstances, because when uh, the US has been hit in such a, a very strong way, we uh, have been, um, we were in a very peculiar situation in Italy because at the same time uh, we were hit very hardly, like you remember. And we have been the first in, in, um, among Western countries. So uh, I think that uh, nobody was ready. I and mean, it would be no honest to say we have been perfect. Uh, there were mistakes everywhere. All organizations made mistakes. The European Union, I think, was very honest, saying uh, uh, we didn't do enough. We made mistakes. And uh, the president of the EU Commission uh, asked um, to, uh, for uh, the forgiveness to the Italian people because they could have done more. But it is understandable. It was something completely new. But then there was a good reaction. Uh, there was a lot of solidarity from uh, all the allied countries. And things are going better. And what is important is that we have to be ready, maybe for a second wave. Let's hope that it doesn't happen. In any case, for next future phenomena of this same kind. Well, I think <clears throat> we've all learned a lot uh, from this. We certainly hope there won't be a second wave, but uh, it is interesting to hear that um, uh, your doctors and your medical people, your public health people are now reaching out to help others. Um, and, and maybe that is you know, one, of the, one of the silver linings, if we can call it that, in this, this terrible uh, pandemic, uh, that um, even over, a six weeks, people have picked up information, ways of treating others, um, best practices, if you will, and now are sharing with others. And that's uh, certainly an important uh, development out of <clears throat> all of the, <clears throat> all of the uh, <clears throat> negatives uh, that have come out of, of this crisis. I wanna shift, if I can, to uh, your long experience. You, you have served, you've served in, your, in Europe, of course, uh, but uh, you also were in, in Tokyo, you're in New York, you served in Israel in the Middle East. Uh, you've had a kind of a hand on the pulse here of various regions in the world over a period of years. How have you seen the essence of diplomacy changing over all of these years? Has the internet made a difference? Is the world smaller? Uh, is, is it, uh, it seems to be more contentious. Uh, what's, what's your view? Well, it's, it's interesting you are somehow pushing me to think back uh, many years ago when I started and there was, uh, it was a different war, the Cold War. And I went to a country, Japan, I was young and um, 
far away, a country which was booming, like uh, now China, with a big difference, like, because we can consider Japan like a like-minded country, so a place which is distant and different, and at the same time, open to our values and uh, to, let's say, Western uh, state of mind and civilization. Uh, but it was a great adventure. And then I discovered, uh, we could have visited this, that nothing is eternal, that empires, even the big Soviet empire, was going to, to finish. And yet, uh, our Western world uh, was still under challenge. We still had reasons to be united, to work together. And um, so we had this 10 years of transition during the 90s when we thought that maybe we could have had, uh, let's say, a unipolar war, the end of history, remember? It was not true. History accelerated, it didn't finish. We had the Balkan Wars, we had new tragedies, and we had September 11th. This was really a defining moment for all of us, especially for me. I, I have... Uh, I, 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 I want to try to, to turn the camera. You see the American flag in... Uh, yes, exactly. Yes, you do. Yes. So this flag has always been in my office since September 2001. I was in New York City at that time, so I've seen with my eyes the, the Twin Towers uh, burning. And I was working at the UN, so we were evacuated by my office, and then I felt that we were attacked all together. We as, uh, because we are the West. So uh, they attacked us, our values, and this was the meaning we are all New Yorkers. We don't have to forget it. And from that time, I see a continuity in my work. Uh, I was attacked by someone because of my values. And then uh, I had the experiences, uh, for instance, working as special envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan. So exactly after 10 years, on September 11, 2011, uh, I went to Herat, where we have our troops. We had and we have still now Italian troops. And I wanted to, to, to commemorate uh, the attack, working and being together with our troops, the American and the, and the Italian troops in, uh, in Afghanistan. And then I had the experience uh, in, uh, in the consulate, completely different, New York City. But this was great because it was the moment when I worked to put together our communities, the American Jewish community, the Italian American community, we had together um, commemorations of uh, the uh, uh, Holocaust, the Remembrance Day. And uh, this was still in order to underline our common values, the values which had been attacked. And then, and then the experience in Israel, uh, somehow discovering the sources of our values, of our civilization, of our spirituality. So independently from our different religions, Israel is really the place which inspires so much uh, all of our history and uh, what we feel attached to. And now NATO, of course, is a place where all this is in action uh, in order to defend something and also to work for something in a different dimension, certainly, because, uh, well, you mentioned uh, the changes in technology. And this is a big change, and not only the fact that we can now uh, talk each other and uh, the confinement is certainly not the same that would have been, uh, let's say, only 10 years ago. 
but also everything is accelerated, is uh, uh, multiplied. So risks are coming at a, a different pace, at a, a much faster pace. And they are, the risk of, of that they are bigger. And the same is with the risks like uh, pandemics, because we travel so much more. And so if something is happening in China, we have repercussions everywhere. It's the so-called also butterfly effect. So if a, a butterfly flies somewhere in China, then you can have a storm in New York City. And uh, these are the big changes. I mean, of course, I could not have imagined this 40 years ago, but we have to live with this. And uh, on the other hand, there is continuity, continuity in values. And NATO represents both things, represent the continuity of an organization which was born uh, more than 70 years ago, in 1949, and uh, uh, because the values are always the same, and it represents uh, an organization which is here to adapt itself to the changements, to the new challenges. And I have to say the strength of NATO probably is that we have for something, not against something, because enemies can change, the challenges change, but the values are the same. And so we have to continue to work for these uh, values and uh, to be ready to face new challenges. So was Soviet Union at the beginning, then we have, uh, we had, and we still have terrorism. We have, uh, of course, a new kind of challenger coming from, uh, from Russia. We can have uh, also challenges coming from, from instance, for instance, from uh, um, the, um, the environment, uh, including climate change or uh, pandemia, because health, is first of all a great, a very important uh, uh, public good for our people, but it's important because, uh, I mean, if you have such big risks, you could, uh, of course, have instability in our countries. And so it's so important, that's why it's so important to have resilience within the countries. And it can be even worse in places like Africa. I mean, if something happens in big dimensions in Africa, and this is somehow similar for climate change and for pandemics, then we could have instability in these countries. We can have mass migrations. These people arrive in our shores and it's really a domino effect. We have to be ready. Well, <clears throat> certainly we say, you know, you've had a front seat to history um, really at the, the end of uh, the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st. And um, clearly your experience in serving these posts almost in, in, on every continent, I think has given you uh, really a, an important worldview. So uh, we appreciate that, that look at, at that worldview. I want to go back to something you did just earlier this year. You spearheaded NATO's first ceremony to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day in Brussels. Uh, it was an incredibly moving uh, tribute and one with great importance. I mean, after all, there is a connection because international alliances, particularly NATO um, and the United Nations, of course, are the foundations of post-World War II uh, society. Um, now, Jewish issues or Jewish related issues have really been uh, of, of special interest to you, and you've done so much to address them uh, in your various uh, positions. Um, prior to uh, your appointment at NATO, uh, you were the coordinator on a very important conference on anti Semitism during Italy's chairmanship of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and I was privileged to, uh, to have participated uh, in, in that program. Uh, there were diplomats, NGOs, <clears throat> experts uh, on the subject, and it really was an important, uh, important event and important, uh, uh, had an important place uh, 
uh, at a time when anti-Semitism particularly was spiking in Europe. But now, of course, we see it everywhere, uh, including here uh, in, in the United States. Now, looking back, what do you think were the major uh, accomplishments and major achievements of both the commemoration at NATO uh, and also the conference in, in Rome? What, what do you think, because uh, we're looking back, first of all, to the first part of this year, to January, but then looking back a couple of years, and things move so quickly, as, as you've just said, they move so quickly. Uh, what do you think um, the, the major achievements were? I think that what is important is that we should always be aware of who we are, which are the foundations of our daily work. I mean, we don't work only, of course, uh, to, to, to have a salary or uh, to do things, but also to defend values and, uh, and our essence. So we are countries which are based on uh, values like uh, individual freedom, like uh, equality and, um, and um, democracy. And of course, this means that we cannot accept racism. We cannot accept uh, intolerance. And uh, anti-Semitism, of course, is the, the, the biggest manifestation of all these sins uh, that human beings can can uh, and continue to to do against ourselves and um, so NATO was born because of this because it was born after World War II of the, the, the largest the biggest tragedy of, of humankind and um, somehow we need to remember this it's not only putting in s together uh, military staff and then people of course this is is our daily work is very important, but why we do it? And we do it in order that we do not repeat the tragedies of the 20th century. And in order to do it, we have to work daily. Is of course we 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 have a, a ceremony on the 27th of January, but we have to work on the all the other 364 days. And uh, for the first time in history, on the 27th of January, on International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, all the flags of the Allied countries have been half massed here at NATO headquarters. And uh, so we organized a ceremony, a simple one, uh, with uh, all my colleagues, uh, staff, uh, people there, and of course, the representatives of the international secretariat at the highest level. We had a um, 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 work of art from the from an Italian artist, uh, and uh, we had a, a flower. We bring a flower to on the barbed wire, remembering a photograph uh, in Auschwitz when a little boy. Uh, who was there, a Jewish uh, uh, boy in the, in, in the concentration camp, uh, had these yellow flowers in his hand. So it's a signal of open commitment. But uh, of course, this should be done in all organizations. So two years ago, we did the same with the OECE. And this was a, somehow a larger and more elaborate opportunity to think about uh, different aspects of anti-Semitism. Um, you, you, it was very important to have the top uh, representatives of the Jewish world. So I thank you so much. It was important to have people like you and other leaders of the big um, Jewish organizations and from Israel. I remember Rabbi, the chief rabbi Israel, Mayor Lau. We were received by the Pope. Uh, this was quite unique. Um, it, I think it was important that we had, for instance, a session, a panel dedicated to the, the issue of anti-Semitism on, online. So we, we met with representatives of social media, of Google, of uh, Facebook. Uh, I think this was another uh, good opportunity. 
um, but of course, it's never enough. It's important to continue. And, uh, and something I, I'm satisfied is that it was not one shot event. It, didn't, it was not one time. We asked uh, the presidency, the following presidency of OEC, to continue. And this is something that the Italian minister asked on this, that very day to the Slovak representative. And they say, yes, of course, we will do it next year. And in fact, it, it was repeated in Bratislava. And this year, again, the, the Albanian presidency did the same, uh, did another conference. And so there is continuity. It's not enough, but we are seeing some uh, fruits. So in Italy, we've, eventually, we have uh, a special representative of government to deal with this issue. Um, it, it, it was strange that we didn't have, but finally we had it, eventually we had it. We are also eventually working on the definition of antisemitism. Uh, it's another step. Um, there is much to do, it's never enough, but uh, these are steps in order that we are what we should be. Well, let me, let me ask about uh, Italy. Uh, you have appointed the, the special um, representative, which is extremely important. Um, but Italy is, is home to one of the most active BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions movements in Europe. And we've also seen uh, Holocaust survivor and Senator Liliana Segre um, require protection from far-right groups. Uh, there was a uh, fundamental rights agency survey on anti-Semitism a couple of years ago, which found that 81% of uh, Jewish Italians uh, believe that anti-Semitism had increased over the past five years. What's your assessment of the situation at home um, and more generally in Europe as, as someone who has always had your finger on the pulse of this particular uh, problem? Well, listen, I, I, I don't know exactly the dimension of the problem. Of course, uh, tools are important and the, and the perception of um, of our Jewish citizens is the most important thing because if they feel uh, uneasy in their own country, this means that uh, we we have a problem. We have a big problem, and it's a shame that uh, we have to be obliged to to give to Senator Segre uh, police uh, protection. Um, and she made a wonderful speech, by the way, this year at the European Parliament. Uh, in, invited by the president, by the chair of the of the, of the European Parliament, but uh, it's something we have to to to, to deal with with education, uh, uh, working every day. That we have a um, we have a virus also in this case, and maybe it's a virus which is even more difficult to to fight with than uh, than coronavirus, and um, we have to find new ways. Probably the internet is, is a big multiplier of lies, of a disinformation. Disinformation now, it's, it's a big issue. In all kind of organization, also in NATO, we're discussing a lot about disinformation, of course, also in, in different frameworks. But uh, um, if uh, the human mind uh, is so easy to be attacked by wrong information by this kind of uh, viruses it means that we have to protect ourselves and uh, with the development of artificial intelligence i don't know where it could go it could be much worse um, we have to work together but in the same time there are also trends toward uh, um, creating new walls uh, in order maybe to protect ourselves, but uh, it, this could stop international cooperation. And um, that's why it's important to have organizations like Bright Read, which is international. By definition, you have branches everywhere. And uh, this is good, I mean, because so you in the NDC can work together with the, uh, colleagues in, in Brussels 
uh, where we had a very, we have a very good relation with your representative, and in Rome, again, where you have a, a very good and active branch. And altogether, we can develop uh, active policies. All in all, I think that the huge majority of Italian people feel that without our Jewish community, Italy would not be the same. Um, but this is valid everywhere in the world, of course. But in Italy, it's very special because especially for myself living in Rome in the center of the city, I mean, I cannot imagine. I mean, I can walk, it's a short distance to, to, the, to the Roman ghetto. They are much more Roman than myself. They are the true Romans since 2000 years. And so the, the, they speak the Roman dialect more than anyone else and the, the cuisine and, the, and all the history. And so we need to preserve this because this is our own identity. And this is related with Israel. You mentioned BDS. I mean, Israel is, is also and so much part of our own identity. Uh, so we need Israel. It's not only that we have to defend the existence of Israel, but if Israel didn't exist, we have to invent it. We have to have it. So Israel not only has the right to exist, but has the duty to exist for us. So this is why BDS is something, uh, something absurd. This goes with, against common sense. When I was in Israel, I said, well, instead of having BDS, we should have PDS, which is promote, develop, and support the relationship with Israel, which is so important to all of us. Of course, one can have different opinions on the current government of Israel. The nice thing, is that like in the US or in Italy, government can change. Israel stays, the US stays, Italy is the same because we are Western democracies. So we are what we are because we are free and the, the country is over the government and the country represents values which are of fundamental importance for all of us. I just have uh, one thing about the Italian Jewish community, and you're so right. I mean, it's an ancient community, and it's a community that we're very, very proud of because of uh, its many accomplishments and because of really it is one of the iconic historic uh, communities. Um, I just one final question on, on Israel. You served uh, for five years, which is really a it's it's a, it's time really enough time to really immerse yourself into uh, into the country into its people into its its culture uh, and while you were there uh, there was one of the Gaza wars I think it was uh, protected edge yeah and uh, this was a defensive war as as all of Israel's wars have been they've been defensive um, rockets were coming in Israel needed to respond of course. Um, and um, as a result of that, and not only protective edge, but we've seen in other cases where it has had to defend itself, um, the, the issue of anti-Semitism, in many cases, it, it, has, it has spiked in certain places because of the response to defend itself. Um, how, to what extent do you feel uh, that there's an understanding, I would say in Italy, but you could, you could talk to it more broadly, of the complex reality on the ground in Israel itself. In other words, the, the issue of the rockets, the issue of the terrorism on the street, never being sure, you sit in a cafe, you're not sure what will happen. Is, do you think there's an understanding there? Not enough, but more and more. Um, during the five years it was, the, uh, well, you remember, this, this conflict in Gaza was, uh, was the longest one uh, because the, the, the interesting thing in Israel is that there is a, a situation of semi-permanent conflict, but at the same time, the, big, the, the real wars are always short, and, uh, but recurrent, unfortunately. And so I was attacked again. So the, the feeling was in, in somehow, similar of September 11, because I mean, the rockets were arriving to all of us, 
So they, they, they didn't distinguish if what was a foreigner or what was a, a, an Israeli citizen. I remember that I think the first victim of a, a, a rocket coming from Gaza was not a Jewish citizen, was a Bedouin, mm. was an Arab Israeli citizen. So because the, the rocket uh, is blind and uh, it's not very smart, but, uh, and I went to visit the family in the desert in the Negev. So I, I, I met the wife of this, this poor Bedouin living in a poor condition and hit by a rocket coming from a, an Arab city. Uh, anyhow, uh, I, you're right. There is not enough understanding because the crisis is very complicated. Because, of course, I'm f in, like in many crises, there are victims everywhere, and there are reasons everywhere, and uh, it's easy to manipulate. Um, so, people who are out don't understand clearly the situation. Plus, we have this terrible thing of anti-Semitism. We should have nothing to do. It's, it's absurd. Instead, we have seen in, uh, in 2014, people uh, going on the streets in, the, in European capitals against Israel and in the same time against the Jews. The Jews, this, this uh, concept. Uh, which is really like an evil in the eyes of some people. But in the same time, I think there is more and more sympathy for Israel, having more and more visitors. I mean, the best way to have people understand Israel is to visit it, to understand the dimension of the country, the vitality of the country, the freedom, and of course, the problems it has. That the problems of security also may be the, the wrong uh, aspects. I mean, one can have different ideas. And this is also a nice thing about Israel. You visit Israel and uh, you see people thinking in the opposite way. Of course, this is typical Jewish, you would say. I mean, uh, you, you, there are people fighting each other continuously about ideas, and this is very nice. And uh, but the, we have really a boom of visitors. We push toward this, and this is somehow part of this campaign I'm working for to promote and to develop the relationship. It was not so difficult because of the interest of the country, because of tourism, because of pilgrimage, because of, of course, scientific relations. We have a boom of scientific relations, of trade relations. And uh, all visitors, after uh, they spent a few days, said, well, it's different from how I imagined it. Uh, I had many, many meetings with uh, groups of uh, travelers from Italy, of all kinds, from the parliament, government, students, military, uh, business. And I always, uh, ask them, how is it? Did you imagine that it was like this? And they say, no, it's different. It's much better. And um, yes, we understand that there are big issues, that there are big problems. They are able to solve them. Of course, they can make mistakes. Not everything is perfect. But the situation is not so much that there is one side that is wrong, the other side is always right. Uh, there are victims and there are uh, those who attack. No. And uh, we know from where the rockets were coming. Well, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much, uh, really, for all you've done in so many different areas. Uh, now at NATO, uh, as ambassador to, to Israel, that conference on anti-Semitism really, I think, uh, raised the level of attention to a very serious problem that was then uh, really beginning to, to reach a, a point of critical mass. Uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts uh, in that. And we also hope, uh, you know, visiting is, it is, it's the best uh, medicine, um, whether it's visiting Israel, visiting Italy, or the United States, we certainly hope that everybody will be able to, to get back and, and do that um, in terms of people to people. 
uh, and that's always uh, an important part of relations amongst our our people. So we thank you for for all you've done. Thank you, thank you. And I hope to so, to meet you in uh, in Brussels soon. In person. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> All right. Special thanks to Ambassador Francesco Tello for joining me today. And thank you for tuning in to One on One with the Brith International. Like what you hear? Make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the Brith YouTube channel. And be sure to visit our website, benebrith.org, to learn about our work. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For my guest, Ambassador Francesco Tello, I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. We'll talk to you next time on One-on-One -on -one with B'nai B'rith International.